So let me just say this. So when I became a Christian, when I gave my heart to the Lord, I don't know what, what describes your initial salvation with Jesus. Maybe you said you were born again. That's a Bible word. Maybe you said you gave your heart to Jesus. That's, that's one of the expressions. An old fashioned expression is, I got saved. Um, all of those expressions are fine. As long as you know that you encountered Jesus, Savior of your soul. So I was a Christian for four years, one, two, three, four, four years before I encountered the power of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Now, if you go, well, that's, that's weird. No, that, that's actually in the Bible. Read the book of Acts and you'll find that the early disciples didn't even know or hear about the Holy Spirit until somebody introduced them. And it was my roommate at college. If you want to hear the full story, buy my book, which is called, God, I don't need a miracle tomorrow. I need one today. And the whole story about the power of God hitting my life. And I want you to know something, friends, before we read the Scriptures. I was scared of the Holy Spirit. I was scared because I'd seen some really wacky, weird people around. Is anybody going to smile at me this morning? And, and they kind of put me off until I realized that looking at the Holy Spirit was actually like looking at Jesus exactly. It was a mirror image of Jesus. Everything about Jesus is the same as the Holy Spirit. Everything about the Holy Spirit is Jesus. Jesus, 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 Holy Spirit. The two are like this. And so my roommate told me I needed the power of the Holy Spirit. I said, no, I don't. I'm fine as I am. But I want you to know for four years, I lived as a dry Christian. Until I surrendered and I got thirsty for the power of God in my life. Is anybody, we've already said that, thirsty this morning. And so I got thirsty for the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. I, I needed, it felt, felt like I needed the engine started in my life. And so I decided to open up my life to being filled with the Holy Spirit. And one night in bed, I don't know what to say apart from it happened. The first thing that happened to me is I, which is very much not me, I want to say that at that time, because I, I wasn't brought up on stuff like that in my church experience. And many of you, maybe you could have come from a Catholic background, Church of England background, Baptist background like I did, Methodist, all those backgrounds. The first thing that happened to me is I started to speak in tongues. Oh, is that one of those churches here? Yeah, we're a Bible church. Can I ask you to do something, please? Don't class weird what is Bible. It may be weird to you, but it's not weird to the Bible. If any time you can catch me out preaching something that is not in the Bible, please come and tell me and say, Pastor Mark, what you said was not in the Bible. And I don't think you'll ever do it. Because what we preach and teach is always in God's Word. But you know what happened to me? Second, within weeks of this happening, Jesus Himself asked me to go and pray for a young 14-year-old boy that was seriously ill in bed, couldn't get out. No cure, no remedy. And my first encounter with the power of God in healing was a young boy. And Jesus said to me, go lay hands on him. And I argued for three days. Many of you know this story. And then I laid my hands upon him in bed and prayed a quick healing prayer, then scarpered. Within hours, he was completely, utterly, totally healed by the power of God. The reason I'm bringing up those stories right now and healing has been part of everything we've done for the last 30 something years is to say this. When I encountered the power of the Holy Spirit, things started to happen that never happened before. A breakout in healing, deliverance, praise, 
all those kind of things. So that's where we're going today. And um, do your best not to exit before the ministry. Don't be scared like me. Okay. Let's uh, look at Luke 24, shall we, today, please? And I want you to know, before you take your seats, you've been standing up a long time. We love you. Thank you so much. But let's stay standing if you can for a few moments. Luke 24. Now, I'm going to give you the context of Luke 24. I'm pointing because I know it's going to... There it is. The context is this. This is Easter Sunday evening or afternoon. This is last Sunday, Easter day. And it's now later in the day. So just to remind you, last Sunday we celebrated the triumphant, triumphant resurrection of Christ. And so what happened is death on the Friday, resurrection on the Sunday. This is Sunday afternoon. So I'm going to speak into next, uh, last Sunday afternoon. So that's why it says now that same day. So this is resurrection day. Are you ready? Now we're going to motor. Come on, Mark. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They reckon it takes about three hours to walk. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus Himself, who? Himself came up and walked along with them. Next verse. But they were kept from recognizing Him. I'm going to pause there because there's a full stop. We, we'll keep that verse there just for a moment. Let me just say this from my own life. And maybe it was worth coming to church just for this. There will be times, friends, when Jesus will be right at your side and you won't know it's Him. Hello? Here's Jesus in His new resurrected body. Straight after the resurrection and Jesus just comes and starts to walk with them on this three hour journey. And they didn't even know it was Him. Let me tell you a quick story while we're holding that there. We have a friend called Lenita Miller. Lenita and her husband were in our church just uh, last year, I think, Gillian. They visited us, came and stayed in our home. We have known Lenita and her husband for 25 years. They live in Seattle, Washington. Lenita showed us a picture last uh, two weeks ago. She was in, she, she drives a little um, pickup truck. Uh, she's close to 70 years of age, driving down the road in her pickup truck. And for some strange reason, she veers off the road, goes down an embankment, 70 years of age, rolls the vehicle several times and ends up upside down in a ditch, hanging from her seatbelt. The car is a complete, the, the pickup is a write-off. The only way she can get out is to smash the window and crawl through on the roof after this terrible accident. Uh, paramedics were caught. Can't believe the wreckage. So they take her to hospital. They take her through all these scans and they find there's not one bone broken. There's no problems. There's no cuts, hardly any bruises. She's just completely, I mean, she's rolled her vehicle several times, smashed it to smithereens, and they can't believe that this 70-year-old lady has just crawled out the window without any, any problems whatsoever. Isn't that amazing? A little bit too quiet here this morning, I think, in this uh, Baptist church. <laughs> but watch this. So they give her a full body scan and the results come back and they said, there's no injuries whatsoever in your body from the accident. However, you have a growth in your stomach the size of a baseball and we need to operate to find out. She's just come out of the operation in the last few days to find out that the, the growth, am I right in saying not if I'm right, Gillian? Stage one cancer. 
They said, we have amazingly caught this in time. This is fine. We've been able to cut it all out. There is no stage two, no stage three. It's not spread anywhere. You say, why are you telling us this while we're reading that? Because she says, if I hadn't have had the accident, they would have never have found out that I had a massive growth in my stomach and I could have been dead from the cancer. Sometimes, friends, that what looked like an accident to you was actually Jesus walking up alongside and say, hey, this may be painful, but this is going to be for your own good. You're right there with me. Some of you are going, hey, I now understand why I went through that for this. Now we kept from recognising Him. Next verse, please. I've waited a long time. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And we read the story and it's like as if we're talking to Jesus about Jesus, but we don't know it's Jesus. How many of you have talked to Jesus about Jesus and you're talking to Jesus about Jesus? And they stood still, their faces downcast. Please take your seats. They stood still, their faces downcast. Stay with me. me. We're going to have a wonderful ministry time this morning. So I just want to preach into it. Our desire is not showmanship. It's not to create champion circuits, but to boldly empower every believer with the power of the Holy Spirit. As per this book so here we have Easter Sunday evening and the disciples the two it says that their faces were downcast is anybody here today don't admit it and your face is downcast the title of the message today that I want to speak into for a few moments before we pray is what's next What's next? And I want you to think about it. What has happened is they've had this incredible encounter. They've looked in the tomb. Jesus has disappeared. He's been resurrected. For a lot of the disciples, they're confused, thinking, is it really the resurrection? We saw from last week that some people said, oh, the disciples stole the body. Hello. And so there's all this kind of, well, And now we feel so lonely and downcast because Jesus, our friend, has now gone. I don't know whether you're like me, but we tend to be as human beings, people that always want what's next. I'm admitting this to you, so I pray that you will support me in it. When I'm eating a meal... I've barely got ready to put my knife and fork down from the main course and I'm thinking about the dessert menu. Is anybody there? Don't tell me you don't like dessert. Come on. Get saved. (laughs) I'm not admitting it to anybody around the table, but I'm thinking, I hope the sticky toffee pudding. Did somebody say, come on. What's your favorite? But you know, We are human beings. We want not what's next. How many ladies say to your husband, if I have that handbag, love, I'll never want another thing. (laughs) You lied. Because the reality is, when that one's worn, I'm looking for the next one. And guys, let's have a little go at you. Maybe it's golf clubs. Maybe, (laughs) of course, maybe it's a car. If, ever, if I have that car, I love, I will never want another one. Do you know, I've got a pastor friend. I love him dearly. He's 70, 77 years of age. And he told me when he was 70, he said, this will be my last car. In the last seven years, he's had four. <laughs> Poke him in the ribs about it. Because we, want, we tend to live from event to event. And when we get to the crucifixion 
and the resurrection and now Jesus has disappeared, what is there to look forward to? Even in church, we live from event to event. We live from Christmas to mankind. And after mankind is all over and all the shouting has gone, oh, it'll be shine next. And after shine, what's after shine? Oh, well, I guess it'll be Christmas next. Have you noticed how we want to go from one experience to another And friends, let me just say this humbly with all the love in my heart to you. Be careful that you don't miss the moments with the Holy Spirit because you live from one experience to another. How many of us are sitting there at Christmas on Boxing Day having eaten yesterday's turkey, cold turkey? There's two different meanings, of course, of cold turkey. We won't go there this morning. Okay, Uh, and you're eating cold turkey And then on the screen of your television comes hot turkey because they want to transport you from your cold living room at Christmas to a hot beach in the Mediterranean because they know you are thinking, what's next? Well, Christmas is nearly over. What's next? Well, let's sell you a holiday to cheer you up. You with me? So we can't blame the disciples for thinking and having downcast faces because they were thinking it's all over. Now watch what happens. So many beautiful people gave their heart to Jesus last weekend on Easter Sunday. Let's celebrate every one of them. Come on. Fantastic. But listen to me carefully. You get saved. You give your heart to Jesus and you can think, well, that's it. I've done it. I've done it. I've done it. And then you can think, well, it'll soon be the summer. No, 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 no. What's next? So I'm going to just speak for a few minutes into what's next. Because when we get to Luke 24 again, we're now going to skip a few verses. So we are nearly at the end of the three mile journey on the same day. And Luke 24, and we see verse 45. Then he opened up their minds, that's Jesus, so that they could understand the Scriptures. And he, Jesus, told them, are you ready? This is written. The Messiah, Jesus, will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name. To all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses, he said, of these things. I am going to send you what my father promised. But you stay in the city of Jerusalem until you have been clothed. Until you've been clothed with power from on high. So their faces are glum. There's nothing to look forward to. Oh, it's all happened. And Jesus comes, hey guys, let me me explain the scriptures. I'm going to rise. I'm going to go back to my Father in heaven. I'll see you there one day. But I want you to know something, fellas. I'm going to send you what my Father, God, promised from the foundations of the earth and they go tell us more Jesus yeah and that promise is the power the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit in your life so for every Christian that goes well I've given my heart to Jesus what's now I tell you what's now this is now because this is not just then it's now And so he says, hey, I want you to go back to Jerusalem and I'm going to ask you to wait. Now, many people say to me nowadays, oh, well, we just need to wait on the Lord because we need to wait because they had to wait. No, they had to wait for God's timetable. God's timetable was 50 days after the resurrection to the Pentecost. Churches have Pentecost Sunday, Pente meaning 50 we were getting ahead of the game because I couldn't wait. 
Because I realised that from last Sunday's response of people being saved, you need this right now. We can't wait. The reason they waited for God's timetable. And on the 50th day, Pentecost, bang, the Holy Spirit comes. But nowadays, you are believed, you repent, you believe, be baptised and receive the Holy Spirit at any time. You don't have to wait. I waited a long time because I thought I had to wait. I didn't realise that this precious gift of my Father God, your Father, was ready for me at any time. Now we're going to dip into a couple of scriptures very quickly before I give you three things that will happen when you receive the Holy Spirit. And then I'm going to ask you to respond. Acts chapter 1, and by the way, if you didn't already know this, it is believed historically that Luke, who we just read from, wrote the book of Acts. So we're actually changing books, but the guy that wrote them is the same guy. And you can kind of feel it when we read these verses because it says, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them in one chapter. It tells us over 500 people he appeared to over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, which is obviously not the occasion on the road that we've just read about, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for, here it is again, the gift of my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Then he describes the gift for John, that's John the Baptist, baptized with or in water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with or in the Holy Spirit. You're still with me? Nobody gone home? Now we skip to chapter 2 of the book of Acts. And if you're wondering why a strange book is called A-C-T-S, Acts, because this is the very first church. And it is actually the actions or the acts of the first church. This is the acts of God in the first church. Now here we have it. So when the day of Pentecost came, that we just mentioned, they were all together in one place, just like we are today. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. Came from where? Not hell, heaven. And filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they, see, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. That tells me, even though that sounds weird, that the person of the Holy Spirit wants to light up every individual life. This is not for pastors and leaders. This is for everybody in the room. And all of the, how many? All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. The word filled there means to the max. To the max. Glug, 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 glug. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And there we go. There we have it. This is what happened to me. We, they began to speak in other tongues. As the Spirit enabled them. They spoke, but the Spirit enabled them. Next verse, there isn't another verse. So here we have the promise of the Father, the promise of the Father. So I want you to know that last Sunday, when we celebrated the resurrection, the events that now take place are Jesus leaves the planet and said, I'm going to send you one of exactly the same kind. Would you... Does anybody have a Bible there that you can just throw me? Anybody with a Bible? No? No? The problem with this church is there's no great Christians anymore. There we go. These are two Bibles. 
They're different. You can see. Mine's just a baby Bible, and this, is, this looks like a Christian, really good, thorough Christian Bible. You can tell by the pages are all turned up. Well done, Gladys. These are different, but they're exactly the same. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit are three persons in one who are exactly the same. Thank you. Different but identical. Exactly the same words. The Holy Spirit is identical to Jesus. You say, well, why do we need the Holy Spirit? Because Jesus has ascended in bodily form and now we need His Spirit to move in and work, work in me. When the Holy Spirit moves in me, it's Jesus moving my hands and my feet. When I open my mouth, it's the Holy Spirit it's Jesus. They're all intertwined. I want you to know that. So let me give you three things and then we're going to pray. Are you ready? The first thing that we see that the Holy Spirit, when He invades your life, and by the way, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He doesn't just hit you on the back of the head and say, Receive! Ho! Oh. All who are thirsty may come. He's looking for thirsty people. He's looking for people right now who say, I need your power. So here's the first word that we find. When the Holy Spirit comes inside of us, this is what happens. We get boldness. Sadly for me, I spelt spelled it wrong I should have been more specific you'll get that next Wednesday <laughs> come on stop playing hard to get today boldness can we just talk about Peter for a second do you remember Peter just before the crucifixion here's what Peter was like distant from his Lord distant following from a distance, scared, scared. He was afraid, ashamed. He was, he was just unwilling to even confess Jesus before a servant girl. Scaredy cat. Everything about Peter said, you're a wimp, scared. Watch what happens. The Holy Spirit comes and in Acts chapter 2, we read these verses. Ready? 14. Then Peter, <laughs> the same guy that couldn't even confess his Lord to a young girl that said, you were with Jesus. No, I wasn't. This is the blasphemer. This is the guy who said, no, he denied Jesus. He hits, he's hit with the Holy Spirit. Then Peter stood up with the 11 raised his voice and addressed the what? The crowd. He couldn't even have a little private meeting with a servant going to say, you were with him? No, I wasn't. He denied his Lord three times. Now he's filled with the Holy Spirit and he can come and get me, guys. I'm ready to take on the world. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd. And he says, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk. As you suppose, it's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Isn't it interesting, friends? That when the Holy Spirit moves on the early Christians, the unbelievers look at them and go, they are drunk. Now, I'm not going to ask you if you've been drunk, but it's called, I, no, I'll be careful what I say. But, but isn't it interesting when a person is under the influence of alcohol, they suddenly become a different person. They're kind of bold, slightly bordering on stupid. Loud-mouthed, couldn't care less. It's 
like timid and shy. Have some Dutch courage and off they go. Everybody knows, oh, they've had too much. Isn't it amazing that the Holy Spirit is seen as like the same as somebody who's drunk? You know what that means? To get drunk, you have to keep drinking. Some of you had a drink in 1979, but you haven't had a drink since. I'm not talking about beer or, or I'm talking about the Holy. Well, I was touched by the Holy Spirit in 1979. Yeah, but did, did you realize it's 2024 now? To get drunk, you have to keep drinking. You keep drinking. I drink every morning. Did you know that? I keep drinking every morning. Every morning I'm drinking. Every night when we go to bed, we're drinking. We have a drink before bed. In the middle of the night, I sometimes wake, I need another drink. You know why I need to keep drinking? Because I leak. I'm supposed to. I'm leaking Jesus wherever I go. So I don't just go, well, I, I was once filled with the Holy Spirit. You hear people say that. Yeah, but I need to be filled every day. Keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Boldness, 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 boldness come upon you. You say, oh, I'm, I'm too afraid, Mark, to open my mouth for Jesus. Hey, you receive the Holy Spirit and you watch what happens. You'll become like a drunkard. You won't care what anybody says. I've told you this story many times before, but when I worked for Dudley Count, uh, when I worked for a certain council <laughs> that was local to this area, <laughs> I was called into my boss's office. She was six foot, she was six foot three, built like a tank. Everybody was scared of the boss of the catering establishment. The reason I got called into her office is because I've been bold talking about Jesus. And she said to me, she said, coming in. She said, we have been, you have been reported for talking about Jesus. She said, now, if you want to talk to me about Jesus, you can. She said, but as of now, you will never talk to anybody while you're at work or on your break about Jesus again. I walked out of that office. I felt taller than she was. I thought, I don't care what you say. I'll be the best worker. I'll be the best person. I'll work hard. I'll work smart. I'll do everything I can. I'm not going to, I'm going to shun work. But you know something? I found out who grasped me up. I never spoke to him. I just heard, I just knew it came from this one particular source. I love to tell this story because God has never mocked friends. They told me, you'll lose your job if you keep talking about Jesus. Hey, he got fired, I got promoted. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Woo. Is anybody ready for the Holy Spirit? He gives you boldness. You didn't realize, you know, I'm a shy, timid person, but under the influence of the Holy Spirit, I'm like another person. I can be bold. I remember not long after receiving the Holy Spirit, I stood outside a very well-known pub in the summer. It was rammed with drinkers outside on the patio. I mean, you couldn't get a space. There was beer everywhere. Here I am, Timmy Shy, Mark Birchall. Nobody said, would you preach? I'm so glad they didn't. But as I'm walking outside this pub, I stop and start to preach at these guys about how they needed Jesus. I started to put on the back of my car, Jesus is the answer. Wherever I went, I bought a motorbike, I had a big white top box and I put on the back, it's Christ you need. Everywhere I went, people would mock. I didn't care. I was drunk. Completely drunk. Second thing that you notice about the Holy Spirit is power. We see this in Acts chapter 3, 1 to 6. Acts 3, 1 to 6. One day, here we go again, same guy, Peter and John, going up to the temple at the time of prayer, three in the afternoon. Now a man who was, who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful Ware. He was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw the same 
guy, Peter, now filled with the Spirit of God. He asked Peter and John for money. Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them, but they were tight. They were called Christians. Smile. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. I go to Champions Church and they're building a building. But what I do have, I give you. What I do have, I give you. I said, what I do have, I give you. Now listen, you can't buy this. You can't pray enough for it. You can't earn it. You can't ever do anything enough for it. But such as I have, said Peter. Well, what I've received, I've received Jesus. I've received the power of His Spirit. Such as I have, I give you. Crippled man, rise up and walk. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you have such as I have in you. The person and the power of the Holy Spirit. I just told you about the second thing that happened to me when I, was t- when I received as a thirsty young Christian. The power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God to heal the sick came upon me. I want you to know it's nothing in me. I was scared. I would pray for whoever I'd still do. Boldness, power. You're going to love point three as we close but I need to preach the whole Bible to you. Would you agree? You don't want me to preach half the Bible and you know, I'm not going to rip a couple of pages out and go, oh, I don't like that bit. Oh, not having that bit. No, 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 no. Oh, they they won't come back to church, Lord, if I I tell them the truth. No, 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 we we need to preach the truth. Whether you come back or not, we have to preach the truth. And I, I do believe that God is building our church because we preach the truth. Point three, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you ready for this? You'll love this one. Uh, <coughs> persecution. Acts 4, 1 to 4. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Here we go. Acts 4, 1 to 4. Then the priest and the captain of the guard, and the Sadducees came into Peter, John, while they were speaking to the people. And they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Just a little side note here, friends, if you can receive a side note. The more the church gets persecuted, the bigger it grows. That's why it is never good to have a smooth sailing church all the time. We should have persecution. The greatest number of their growth, they grew to 3,000 one day and the next it was five. And you know where the preachers and the pastors were? In jail. (laughs) Let's chuck them in prison. That should sort it out. And while they're in prison, the church grew by 2,000 people overnight. That gives us hope. But I want you to know that persecution is part of the package because many of you keep saying, Jesus, where are you, Jesus? Jesus, where are you? Why have you left me? Why have you? No, he's just, you're just suffering persecution for being a Christian because your boldness, you're like a drunk person walking around. Power, authority, boldness. So a little bit of persecution comes your way and you start to think, oh, this is a shame. No, no, come on, grab it with both hands. Persecution can be a very good friend if you'll let it be. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Why don't we all stand together today, shall we? Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. That was about as half-hearted as a... Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the gift that your Father promises, the Holy Spirit. So what we've done is we fast-tracked from Easter Sunday now to the week later, and we've explained and taught about how we need to receive the power, the person of the Holy Spirit. And I want to finally say this before we pray, is please stop Living 
Stop living from one event to another. Oh, there's nothing to look forward to now. Hey, what about looking forward to this afternoon with the Holy Spirit? I've got my mother-in-law coming for lunch. I need the Holy Spirit. (laughs) I often joke, I've got my mother-in-law for lunch. I hope she's tasty. No sense of humor in this church today, is there? What on earth has happened to you? Stop living from high to high. Oh, you know, I've got to wait another three weeks, another, another three months for our holidays. I don't know what we're going to do. Three months till our holidays. Hey, what about three minutes to an encounter with the Holy Spirit? What about daily enjoying what the Bible calls the fellowship of the Holy Spirit? Talk to Him wherever. What do we have today, Holy Spirit? What do you want me to do, Holy Spirit, today? It's amazing how He talks to you. He teaches you. Does those wonderful things. So we're going to worship and we're going to pray. It's just 10 to 12. We've got a good 10 minutes. And uh, let's just see what the Lord wants to do here. Healing the sick. Baptizing people in the power of the Holy Spirit. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Maybe you're not ready. But I know there are hundreds of people that are. You know what I believe the first thing that needs to happen? Is that every one of us needs to know that boldness to speak out. Speak out the name of Jesus. Where you've been timid and sharing your faith. Surely the presence of the Holy Spirit gives you a boldness like Peter that begins to confess Jesus. I keep hearing tumors, 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 tumors. I believe in this gathering right now, this is not somebody online. This is somebody in the building that you have tumors in your body. It's not one tumor. You have more than one, maybe three tumors in your body. Nobody even knows about them, only nearest and dearest. But right now, in the name of Jesus, and the right now, in the name of Jesus, when you get home, examine your body. See what the Lord has done in you in this service. This is where miracles flow. When the Holy Spirit breaks out, all manner of things happen. If you've never spoken in tongues, don't say, oh, I'm not going to that church. It's one of those. Hey, of course it's one of those. We are a Bible church. It's time that we resurrect the Bible. The power of the Holy Spirit. I speak in tongues every single day. Oh, I don't like you then. Well, fair enough. Let's lift our hands. Now, this is going to be tricky to get to everybody. So we're now relying on just the power of God to travel, of course. I'm looking at everybody standing in the staircase here. Everybody all the way around that staircase, all across the rail there. Everybody up there, still time to come join the queue. Everybody up this staircase right to the rail. Everybody up here right the way to the second part there. Let's just lift our hands. This is the way we read. This is the kind of posture that we say. So I'm going to pray a prayer. Are you ready? And all our leaders present, scattered around this building, they don't know anything about this, but they do now. All our leaders scattered around this building, all our pastoral team, all our pastors, are going to look around the room right now, and they're going to direct their hands towards people. We're just looking around the room. What a beautiful sight. We can change the world with this. So I'm going to pray with you, but I'm going to pray for you. Here's my simple prayer. 
Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your promise, which is the promise of the Holy Spirit. You have never broken and never will break a promise. So therefore, we are 100% convinced and committed that you are convinced and committed to us. I want to thank you for all these precious people, young and old, those who got saved a few days ago, those who've been saved for years. I want to thank you, Lord God, that in a moment we're going to ask each of us individually, fill me with your promised Holy Spirit. And I do believe, Lord God, there will be an outbreak, an outpouring of healing, boldness, speaking in tongues. And by the way, if you're going to speak in tongues, you need to open your mouth. You can't speak in tongues with your mouth closed. So get ready for the Holy Spirit to enable you. Some of you, we have all the nations of the world gathered here at our footstool right now. And we thank God that we can all speak in a, the wonderful language of the Holy Spirit. So Lord God, I pray, unleash your power in this place. Unleash your power in this place. Now listen to me carefully. If you've never received Jesus, if you've never received Jesus, you can't receive the power of the Holy Spirit unless you first of all put Jesus first in your life. So here, with every head bowed, every eye closed, here's a prayer. If you've come into this atmosphere, into this church today, and you're going, wow, I need this Jesus. This is especially for you. Just for one person, maybe for a dozen, maybe 20, 30, 40. Pray this prayer in your heart. Nobody else pray out loud. Just pray it in your heart right now. Lord Jesus, I need you. I need you as my Lord and my Savior. I'm lost without you. I turn from my own ways. I turn from my sins, my failings. And I thank you, Lord, for dying for me on the cross of Calvary. But I want to thank you that Easter Sunday told me that you were raised from the dead. And I now believe Jesus is the Son of God. So, Lord God, I place my faith in you right now, Jesus. I look to you as my Lord and my Savior. I open my heart to you, Jesus. And now at the same time, fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, let's clap our hands and thank God for everybody.